guys, welcome back to my channel. I, it's been a little bit since I posted and I have moved and so I'm in Chicago now. I've been here for about a month. I am not totally settled in yet, but I am settled in enough that I found my tripod and I thought I would make a video for you guys. So I wanted to talk today about something that you may have been hearing because it's been in the news quite a bit and that is gravitational waves. You may have been hearing this and you're curious about what it is and so I thought I would talk a little bit more about it. I'm actually not going to get too much into the physics because the, the concept is pretty simple but the execution is beyond me when it comes to the math and everything. But, okay, so one of the things that I think is super cool about astronomy but is also super constraining is that we are sitting here on Earth, our little point in space, and we want to find out more about all these things that are out there in the universe, but we can't go there. We can't manipulate them. We can't, you know, bring them into the lab and run experiments on them. So really, all we can do is observe them. And so we're basically limited to the light that is coming to us from these objects, plus the occasional cosmic rays and neutrinos. But in general, it's, it's pretty much electromagnetic radiation, which is light. And it's really amazing how much we can discover from light. I am constantly floored by it. Um, but it would be really awesome if there was another form of waves that could bring information to us that maybe light couldn't. And it turns out there is, and those are gravitational waves. And so that's really cool for astrophysics that um, there's this possibility for us to probe deeper or different things than we can with light. For example, for cosmologists, this could be a really good way to probe the very, very early universe. Um, there's a period of time in the universe called recombination where all of these um, charged particles basically found their mates and created this neutral universe and that's when the universe became transparent. But before that the universe was opaque so we cannot see things from before that time in the universe because the light just couldn't escape to reach us. But gravitational waves could potentially come from that period and we would be able to learn more about that time which is which is pretty exciting. <laughs> So, uh, people have been musing about gravitational waves since about the late 19th century. And part of the reason for this is because the, there's a, a lot of similarity between Coulomb's law for electromagnetic force and Newton's law for gravity. So this is Coulomb's law for electromagnetic attraction or repulsion. Um, so it's basically just this force between the two objects is equal to a constant times their two charges divided by the distance squared. So it's called inverse square law. And here is Newton's law of gravity, which says that the force of gravity, the attraction between two objects, is equal to some constant times their masses times the square of the distance between them, which is also an inverse square law, and these two laws have a very similar form. And so people speculated, well, if electromagnetic radiation can make waves, then why can't there be such a thing as gravitational radiation that makes waves? But it's not quite as direct of a comparison as it might seem. Notice here that gravity has a negative sign, which means that the force of gravity is always attractive because these two masses are always positive. Whereas the Coulomb's law doesn't have a sign because the sign is dependent on the charges because you can have positive and negative charges. But there's no such thing as a negative mass, and so you can't have the equivalent of an electromagnetic dipole which has a positive charge and a negative charge. So that was just kind of where, where it was at until Einstein came along, um, of course. <laughs> And his theory of general relativity in 1916 actually predicted gravitational waves. This was the first time that we had a real theory of actual gravitational waves. But it wasn't settled science even after this um, came out. In fact, Einstein himself wasn't even sure whether this was a real phenomenon. He predicted three types of gravitational waves. And in fact, two of them were later proved to be just a, um, a construct of the choice of coordinates. And so they weren't real um, actual physical phenomenon. Um, but the third one was still potentially um, a real phenomenon. The only thing, I, this was Eddington, I believe, that tried to, to disprove these waves. And the third one, he proved that it would always travel at the speed of light um, in any coordinate system, but he was not able to disprove this one. So the, this third type, these transverse waves, were still um, postulated. For a while, the field debated about whether these waves existed, whether they could carry energy, uh, what, you know, what type of form they might take. And then uh, there was a a big conference in the 1950s and I believe Feynman proposed this this thought experiment which is called the sticky bead thought experiment which basically helped them all think through the fact that gravitational waves could indeed do work and so they must be able to carry energy and so th at that point there was a, a pretty good um, a pretty cohesive theory for gravitational waves so what are gravitational waves well, basically 
Einstein's theory of gravity tells us that mass actually warps nearby space-time. Um, so you may have seen this as like kind of the, the two-dimensional grid that has a, a big ball in it and the ball is sinking it down and making the grid kind of kind of go down like that, um, which is usually how I actually think about it. So it's, it's a good way to think about it, I think, except just remember that that's a two-dimensional representation. This is actually happening three-dimensionally, and so it's um, it's very hard to for us to picture that in three dimensions, but the two dimensional case, we can just remember that that is what, it, what it's indicating. Accelerating objects as they warp their space time can kind of cause these ripples um, in the space time which propagate outward. So if you imagine if you did have a, you know, the rubber sheet and you had a ball on it and it was a big ball and it was spinning or something, and then it would cause a disturbance in the sheet that you could detect at a different point on the sheet, which is basically exactly what we're trying to do here on Earth. These, these waves propagate at the speed of light. Um, they um, are transverse waves, so that means they basically affect matter perpendicular to its direction of travel. So if the, the gravitational wave is coming in this way, it can cause the particles to move in this plane. And that's, that's really as simple, as simple as it is. But like I said, the, uh, the Einstein's theory goes into some very deep math that is um, difficult. <laughs> in fact, unsolvable in many cases. And I'll, um, there's a whole field called numerical relativity where they use computers to help solve some of these uh, math equations to, to probe them a little bit further. So that is the theory of gravitational waves. So theories are awesome and I love them, <laughs> but they're just, they're just what ifs pretty much until we can actually confirm them in some way. And in astronomy, that usually means by making observations. Like I said, that's really the only way we have to get to get information for about all of these things out there. And so um, the field kind of turned its attention to how to detect these. And in the 1960s, they built the first detector. It was an antenna type detector um, by a guy named Weber. And by the end of the decade, by the end of the 60s, he was saying that he was making detections and, uh, and a fair amount of detections as well. Um, so this was pretty exciting, um, but when other people built these antennas and tried to detect things, they weren't getting any detections. And if Weber's detections were real, then it, it wouldn't have been physically possible. The, the galaxy itself would have just dispersed. So it was, it was figured out that these were spurious detections, and so then the field kind of died down a little bit um, because it was kind of thought it was not going to ever be possible to detect these waves because the expected impact here on Earth from these gravitational waves is very, very small. That was kind of where it was at until the mid-1970s when there was um, a pair of astronomers, I forget their names, <laughs> that detected this uh, pulsar binary. So it was two neutron stars orbiting each other and one of them was also radiating as a pulsar. And they were able to observe this system and they saw that the orbit of these two stars was decaying. And in fact, it was decaying in the precisely the same way that the theory of gravitational waves would have predicted to carry away, to emit gravitational waves and carry away that energy. Because as the energy of an orbiting system um, decreases, their orbits start to decay. So this was uh, not a direct observation of gravitational waves, but it was an indirect confirmation that this uh, was, a, that was a true theory, basically. And so it kind of revitalized the field and they started to really push for making actual detections of these gravitational waves, direct detections. So the previous antenna design that Weber tried to do uh, was kind of discarded in favor of an interferometer design. So an interferometer is a type of device that's been around for a long time and it basically you have a source of light that starts out in phase and then it travels two different paths and then recombines and then you look at the interference pattern it makes and um, that interference pattern is based off the difference in path length between the two um, paths. And so if you have really small differences in those path lengths, you'll actually be able to see that in the interference pattern. And so it's uh, very ideal for detecting these very small variations. And it, uh, the, your ability to detect the smaller, um, the smaller variations increases as the length of these legs that you're traveling increase. And so now we have these observatories that have very long legs to help us detect these gravitational waves. You've probably heard LIGO, and that stands for the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. And that is located here in the US, and it was first funded back in 1988. Uh, so this is a very long, um, expensive, <laughs> tough project. Um, and it started um, taking observational data in 2002. So there's actually two LIGO locations. There's one in Hanford, Washington, and one in Livingston, Louisiana. And the reason they have two, or that they're trying to separate them as much as possible within the United States, is that it helps you eliminate spurious local detection. So if only one detector detects something, then we know it's a local phenomenon and it's not one of these gravitational waves that's coming and passing through the entire Earth. So by having two locations, they can um, basically confirm their detections better. 
So they started observing in 2002, like I said, and they didn't find anything um, for a long time. <laughs> and they started building in these upgrades um, to increase the sensitivity of the detectors. And then in 2015, in September 2015, they detected the very first gravitational wave. Um, and it was announced in February 2016, and it was a very big deal. You probably heard about it back then if you follow any sort of science news, and maybe even if you don't. And this is super cool. Um, one of the things that I love about this detection, they detected a black hole merger that was, I don't remember off the top of my head, but I wanted to say something like 1.3 billion um, light years away. And you can actually listen to this. So gravitational waves have a frequency, just like light or sound waves or any other kind of wave. And so they converted these, these gravitational wave frequencies into a sound frequency, and you can actually listen to what it sounds like. So you're listening to these two black holes colliding billions of light years away. Like, it's amazing. Okay, so this is, uh, this is what it sounds like, and I'll also link this. I've listened to this so many times and I still think it's awesome. And one of the things that you can see on this is that both the Hanford and the Livingston detectors are detecting the same signal. And so that was part of the reason that they knew that this was a real signal. And they shifted the frequency band so you can hear it a little differently at, at different points there. So, so that was super exciting. <laughs> In addition to LIGO, you may have heard Virgo. Uh, so Virgo is not an acronym, it actually is named after the Virgo Cluster, which is a cluster of galaxies. And it is located in Italy, and it was initially proved in 1993. So again, very long, very expensive project. I believe there's six countries involved in the Virgo project. So it was completed in 2003, and it began observing runs in 2007, until 2011, but it didn't find anything. Similar to LIGO, they took it offline, they did upgrades to increase the sensitivity, and it started observing again just in 2017. And in August of 2017, both LIGO and Virgo detected a, uh, another black hole merger. And it was announced just recently at the very end of September 2017. And this is really exciting because one, Virgo detected it, so it's their first detection, so we know that their system works too, which also you know, helps um, provide validity for these results. And because gravitational waves uh, don't have a directional component, um, by having multiple detections of the same event, it helps us to triangulate the location in the sky where we think those things might be coming from, and that in turn can help us put, uh, observe that, uh, that region and potentially have additional um, other observations to see these things, because we're only detecting these via gravitational waves right now, so there is not an optical or a light observation to match with this. So far, four gravitational wave events have been um, observed. So for all four were observed at LIGO, and Virgo observed the most recent one. And all four have been black hole mergers, which uh, one of the things that we can detect here on Earth is black hole mergers because the masses involved are so large and the acceleration is so fast as they spiral into each other at the end of the merger that it actually produces a big enough wave that we can detect it here. Um, some of the other things that we might be able to detect um, would be a neutron star merger or a neutron star black hole merger, <laughs> uh, mass some massive supernovae, um, and, and some other types of phenomena like that. So usually big big events. <laughs> on October 3rd, the Nobel Prize Committee announced the Nobel Prize in Physics for 2017, and it went to the LIGO-Virgo collaboration to Rainer Weiss, Barry Barish, and Kip Thorne. This is very exciting news. This is definitely, this is definitely a huge um, step forward um, for the field. It's very exciting. And LIGO and Virgo have announced that they have a press conference tomorrow at 10 a.m. Eastern, and so they're going to be announcing something new, we don't know what yet, um, so that's very cool, so if you're interested, you can, you can tune into that, I believe we'll just be having a live stream online, um, and hopefully we'll have some new cool news for this very cutting edge of astronomy. I hope you enjoyed this video, and I hope you learned a little bit of something about gravitational waves, and I hope you come back for my next video, which hopefully will not be another month, but we'll see. <laughs> I'm kind of busy. <laughs> Alright, thanks for watching, have a good one, bye. <laughs> Laser interferometer. <sighs> Sorry for the lighting. I don't really have lights set up. This is my overhead light. And my condo is really small and dim. This is actually a different chair than the one I had in Charleston. I mean, it's it's the same one, but it's it's not the exact same one. <laughs> that one's still in Charleston.